Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us for our webinar, Culturally Sustaining Pedagogy, Bridging Theory and Practice. Um, I encourage you all to introduce yourselves in the chat and let us know where you're from, um, what role and organization you're in um, to get the conversation going. My name is Marisa Crowder. I'm the lead for the Cross Rail Working Group on Culturally Sustaining Pedagogy. The working group has guided the development of this webinar to strengthen the field's understanding of what culturally sustaining pedagogy looks like in practice. We have invited four guest speakers to share about their experience and knowledge from different systems perspectives. To start, here are a few helpful tips for using Zoom. If ever you cannot hear audio, please use your phone to call the number on your event invitation. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to post your thoughts in the chat, but remember to use the Q&A function or to raise your hand to ask questions to our guest presenters. Tracy will be monitoring the chat for any questions, any technical questions. Closed captions are available from the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. And again, if you have technical questions, please tag Tracy in the chat and we'll do our best to support you. Please note that we are recording this webinar and the slides and recording will be posted on the Rail Pacific website following this webinar. We'll also email uh, um, the links to everyone who registered, so please keep an eye out for an email from railpacific at mcrell.org. So I've been mentioning the RHEL um, and they may be wondering what is the RHEL program? So RHEL stands for Regional Educational Laboratory. The purpose of the REL is to work in partnership with education stakeholders to build capacity to improve their education systems. REL support access to research and evidence to address high priority needs in partnership with educators to improve education systems through building sustainable partnerships and work. It is a federal program um, within the US Department of Education and as a result, our work is conducted at no cost to stakeholders. This webinar is intended for education practitioners who are familiar with culturally sustaining pedagogy and are interested in learning more about how it can be applied in real world settings. To begin, I will review what culturally sustaining pedagogy is and how it relates to student outcomes. Then our panel will share examples of what culturally sustaining pedagogy can look like in practice across multiple educational contexts. Then I'll close out by sharing available open source resources related to culturally sustaining pedagogy and equity. I invite you to stick around until the end to complete a brief feedback survey to let us know how we can improve our future webinars. I understand that the uh, cultural sustainability and culturally sustaining pedagogy can be a sensitive topic for some. So I wanna ground our conversation in a set of norms and expectations. So please be respectful of each other's thoughts and opinions and recognize that we are all at different parts of our learning journey about culturally sustaining education and pedagogy. Assume good intent from others and please take this opportunity to learn more about culturally sustaining pedagogy by asking questions and engaging in the dialogue. All right, so as I mentioned, we're, I wanna review what is culturally sustaining pedagogy. And to do so, I'm interested in your thoughts. Um, so let's get engaged in a collaborative meaning-making activity using the chat. So please post in the chat your own definition of what culturally sustaining pedagogy is. And if you're having some difficulty, I post some, some probing questions um, to get the thoughts, your thoughts going. Um, so if you were to enter into a classroom or school, what would it look like or what would it sound like or what would it feel like if you walked into an environment uh, that was engaged in culturally sustaining pedagogy? So please take a few moments to respond to this question in the chat. Thank you, Shauna, who says uplifting, sovereign affirming, identi identity strengthening. That's great. Acknowledging different cultural norms in the class. Respect all cultures. All backgrounds, yep. Multilingual students using home languages. Students working together using their strengths. Various languages again, mm -hmm. transparency, high expectations while reaffirming strengths. I 
everyone's represented. You guys are posting a lot of really great ideas. If I can't call them out all out, I apologize. Um, but I'm seeing some common threads here. Contextualized lesson based on students' cultures. That's great. Empowering students to change the status quo. Mm -hmm. Students cognitively and actively engaged in content. Decentralizing the status quo. So I am seeing some common themes uh, emerge across responses, including all learners, um, incorporating language, um, empowering students has come through, while also maintaining the um, academic rigor and high expectations. Mm -hmm. Connects to the real world is also very important. This is great. Thank you all for engaging in this um, collaborative meeting making. Please feel free to continue adding your thoughts as they come. I would like to share uh, what does the how does the literature define culturally sustaining pedagogy? So Aleem and colleagues propose culturally sustaining pedagogy as a shift from culturally relevant and responsive practices. They argue for a more explicit focus on sustaining dynamic communities and their cultures and languages. So culturally sustaining pedagogy is a strengths-based instructional approach that centers and sustains the cultural and linguistic identities, experiences, and ways of knowing of diverse students, families, and caregivers, and communities. It is one approach to promoting equitable access to quality learning opportunities and seeks to affirm and uplift students' identities and experiences by incorporating them into classroom practices. Although to the best of our knowledge, there is no impact study on the relationship between culturally sustaining pedagogy and student outcomes. However, research suggests that it is positively correlated with student achievement, engagement, and well-being. What culturally sustaining pedagogy looks like will look different across communities and contexts, and that is because it is inherently dynamic and responsive to students' social identities. On our slide is a photo of a recent infographic that was developed by the Cross Rail Working Group on Culturally Sustaining Pedagogy. A link to the infographic will be shared in the chat. If Tracy hasn't done so, done so already, it will be there soon. It outlines four common elements that emerge across practices. Specifically, culturally sustaining pedagogy center dynamic communities and their languages, practices, and knowledge, include student and intergenerational community agency and input, support positive relationships with the land and the people of the land, and provide structured opportunities to contend with internalized oppressions. Lastly, it's important to note that our infographic was a resource that was developed to describe classroom practices, but the goal of our webinar is to expand this understanding to learn what culturally sustaining pedagogy looks like across multiple contexts. So I'd love to hear from you again. Um, after we've gotten you know, our collaborative meaning making activity and I shared what the literature says, does that align with your understanding um, and why or why not? Oh, thank you, Sarah. Increased attendance and participation would be good indicators of success, I agree. Oh, yep, yeah, I can go back, no problem. So how does this align with what you had thought coming into the webinar? Um, or I guess, does it align with what you had thought previously? So taking a look at the chat, we have questions about what sustaining looks like. Um, maybe 
additional information about those last two points, um, which we will hopefully have an opportunity to share about when we engage in the question and answer sec section of our webinar today. And it sounds like these last two points um, might be something that is, you know, part of culturally sustaining pedagogy, but not is not what commonly comes to mind when people think about that as an education practice. So that's really neat to hear. And there's the alignment with the first two, right? Okay, great, thank you all. So without further ado, we're gonna to get to the fun part of our webinar, um, our fireside chat. And what we mean by this is we wanted to, this to be um, more of an infor informal way to access the knowledge and expertise of our panelists by engaging them in a conversation or in question and answer session. Um, so, Please uh, take the opportunity to learn from these experts by using the Q&A function or raising your hand. I will be monitoring the Q&A function and, and those who are raising their hand. Um, and again, if any technical issues come up, Tracy um, is on the team to support you through the chat. So the Zoom webinar provides lots of, lots of uh, means to engage with one another. Um, and that's how we are kind of delim delineating those, um, those roles there. So it is my honor to introduce our panel today. Our guest presenters are all educators and leaders, and they bring to this discussion a great deal of experience and knowledge from different systems perspectives. Dr. Vanessa Anthony Stevens is an associate professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction, College of Education, Health and Human Sciences at the University of Idaho. She was married to Dr. Philip Stevens and mother of two daughters, Carmen and Hazel. Vanessa's research highlights the gifts of indigenous community-centered education and the tenacity of critical participatory research to advance local educational equity. Mr. James Ford is a retired educator from Lewiston, Maine Public Schools. He was the restorative practices coordinator and the family and community support coordinator for the district. Prior to that, he was a special education and social studies teacher in Portland, Maine, and before that, Auburn, Maine. He is on the Maine State Board of Education and the Maine State Charter School Commission and served on the Social Studies Standards Committee. Ms. Hema Haudegi is a middle school teacher and the TK through eight literacy coach at the Language Academy of Sacramento, a dual language immersion charter school. Hema was recently selected as the California Charter Schools Association, Sacramento County, Teacher of the Year. And last but not least, Ms. Mariana Prashnik Enriquez is a proud first generation American committed to furthering the collective narrative of educational equity. Originally from sunny Miami Beach, Cal uh, Florida, I almost said California, Florida, she has lived and served in education policy spaces in Oregon for the past eight years. She is currently the director of the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion in the Oregon Department of Education. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. My goal is to have each of them respond to this initial question to kick off the conversation. Then I'll open the floor for presenters to share um, and conduct uh, the question and answer session. Um, after about 15 minutes, I'll, I'll wrap us up to conclude the question and answer and we'll get into the open source resources. So let me uh, first ask the question, how do you support or promote cultures of setting pedagogy in your role or context and open up the floor to our presenters to share? Anyone like to go first? James? I'll be brave. Thank you. <laughs> well, one, um, I, as I think of, of uh, cultural um, this issue that we're talking about, um, I'll just share with you where, where I last worked in Maine, one of the whitest states in the country, that the city 
that I worked in the second largest in the state with 35,000 people. And the students were 40 plus percent of color. And the staff was 99.9% white. And there were more than 40 languages spoken in the district. So those are the challenges we had. So what better use of parents? Parents are a lot of them are new, new to education, new, new to the states, new to American ways. They haven't assimilated yet. And so having them learn the system and having us learn the cultures at the same time helps bring the people, the groups together to help students become better suit, Americanized in a student way, but also um, to help give, them, give the student support and the parent support and the teachers and staff um, some sense of comfort or, or strength in knowing that the work that they do can be cross-cultural, cross-international. Teaching in other languages or understanding the other cultures, how do, how do they come to school? What do they expect from school? What do we expect from the students when they come to school? What role can their parents have in getting them to, to get their students to, to be active in school? Um, it's, it's a 24 seven venture. Um, so we, we've developed um, parent leadership groups to first learn and work with the superintendent, admin, teachers. And then they, they in turn then talk to their neighbors and say, hey, this is, this is how we do it. This is how you can learn from us. And they're in the schools open to questions and concerns. Uh, for example, we have many uh, families from Somalia, and we initially, or I won't say we, but the this, this school initially would get all their uh, prepared materials translated and sent home without realizing that Somalia, Somalian is a written, a spoken language, and the families don't read it. So the papers sent home weren't valuable at all. So we've moved to like audio, like we send things home via <clears throat> on the website in Somali so they can so they can hear it. Because um, reading is not something they do. Um, so because it's all we learn from from making mistakes. That's what students do too. So um, I'll stop there. I don't want to go on too long. Thank you. I could piggyback off of what James was discussing. So we're a dual language immersion program, and I think that in and of itself is a very diverse cultural, we embrace cultures, we embrace diversity as a dual language Spanish immersion program. We're a 90-10 model here in Sacramento. Um, we are very diverse in terms of California. If we look at the state of California, our students, we do have uh, 94% Latinx students, which doesn't make us diverse in our own setting as much. We're very Latino centric. However, in the grand scheme of you know California and classrooms, 95% of our teachers are Latinx. So our but we match the the teachers match what they see in the kids. So that's that's huge and um, something that we definitely do as a school. Our database planning. So we we're student. <laughs> We're at the student level when we when we plan we we look at the student by name by you know not just the number we don't overgeneralize so in these MTSS meetings that we have across grade levels um, as a literacy coach I sit in on all of the meetings with all of the teachers in the first round so that's already trying to really hone in on those needs. We look at assets, we start with what are the kids doing well, always looking at what they do know instead of what they don't know. So we really try to hit all of the, the foundational skills, the academics, but with the, very, with the mindset of, you know, what, what do they already have and what are they already bringing to the table? So that's something that we 
we had been doing, but I think we've just got better at it over the years. And with um, <clears throat> assessments that, that we're implementing, although we know that they may be, you know, assessments aren't always great, but <laughs> and they're not um, the best, we try to really cater them to our students and what the students need. So if a student is bilingual or speaking in Spanish only or English only, we take it. So if they know numbers, letters, whatever it is, in one of the languages, we know that they know the language. Now it's just a matter of transferring. So that's something that we definitely try to make our teachers really be data-driven, but with con conscientious data-driven discussions. Um, another thing that we did do that was very powerful at our school, we completed an anti-racist survey during COVID. Um, one of the professors at Sac State um, sat with us a couple of times um, as a staff. We had a few in-services, and we really wanted to determine what was lacking in our program. And something that came out of it was the libraries that we had, our classroom libraries. We wanted to make sure that our kids were feeling seen, and if they weren't, or if they weren't seeing all cultures, we really wanted to take the time to purchase books where our students were represented, all students were represented. So that took us to revamping in the middle school, a lot of the books that we were teaching. So now we have um, different books, including you know all from all facets of life so that our kids can see the different cultures, embrace the identity, all those great things. We, um, in middle school, there's an advisory period. So for those of you looking to make some like small changes, so 20 minutes where it's a time to really embrace their culture, their time together, um, creating those relationships with the teacher, with each other, with students, bringing in different um, ways of thinking, different cultures, whatever it is that has to be done. It's only 20 minutes, so you can't do my, uh, like, can't do the whole, can't do everything, but being very mindful and very specific about those things that you really want to see. And our kids, we're having an anti-bullying rally this Friday that was created by our student council. So they've been going around talking to the kids. So all of these these different ideas that come from students or staff or teachers, parents, we really take the time to discuss at the different levels, be it at the governing board level, at the student level, at the parent level, and really try to make those changes. So those are some of the little things that, that we've tried to implement at our school. And I'll stop there. I am happy to go next. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you, James. Um, I want to kind of structure my response around what my role is in supporting culturally sustaining pedagogy in almost like cascading levels, right? And so starting with the big we. I work at the Oregon Department of Education, and uh, we serve so many cascades within that educational layer. Uh, we have uh, from our most recent reports, over 500,000 students, over 340 languages spoken across our states, um, around 89,000, a little less than 89,000 educators, uh, many of which hold intersectional identities that align to the students being served, but many who do not as well, right? And so that just kind of uh, what James was sharing around the, the challenges of having a uh, you know, divergence between the alignment of identities across educators and students and families being served and, and the different challenges that that can present. We have 197 districts. Of those districts, there's about 1,300 schools, 132 charter schools, and 19 education service districts, which are um, regional service support kind of hubs that provide services and support to um, districts, often which are, are small and rural and do not have the, the funding and infrastructure to um, kind of hold all of those services and supports in-house. Um, and so here at the Oregon Department of Education, 
I work at the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And our office is one of the offices that engages the most with community-based organizations, as well as all of those other entities that I um, described. And so from that big we as an agency, there's a smaller we of the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And in our office, we're charged with the responsibility of doing high quality and efficacious, which often means uh, you know, having to move a little quicker than we would want, implementation of legislative initiatives that are passed by the Oregon legislature. And so uh, we don't get to uh, decide what programs we implement. Those decisions are made by our legislature and uh, the budgets around those programs and a lot of the parameters around how we're supposed to implement them are actually written into statute. We are charged with adopting rules through the State Board of Education in order to provide a little more parameter, a little more um, guidance to what is included in statute. But my individual role, my particular role as the director of the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion is to create the conditions that are necessary for our actual work of implementing these programs. They are they are at the level where that that magic really happens um, in comparison to, uh, to to what's happening in schools, right? Which is where the magic really, really happens and in our community-based organizations. Uh, my focus in my role is on systems, it's on practices, it's on processes, but overall it's on policy. And a lot of the, the policy that I am often working with is policy that is implemented at the state level. And so it, it's a very unique um, intersection and approach that's required to create systems, processes, and policies that are going to meet the needs of all of those students that I spoke to a couple of minutes ago and all of those districts and all of those schools. And when you're talking about a concept like culturally sustaining pedagogy, which is in and of itself extremely tailored and unique in order to be impactful, right? What that looks like at a state level sometimes requires a little bit of uh, complexity and nuance when considering. And that's where I'll stop because I want to save some good stuff for the next questions. Well, I'll, I'll add um, my vantage point in with with my brilliant colleagues. Um, I work in higher education, so I'm faculty in a department that does a lot of work with pre-service teacher education, so touching our future teachers, also a great deal of work with in-service teachers and administrators and ed leaders in terms of their continued professional development. Um, and I think, you know, adding to what's been shared about kind of the different like scope and scale of how we think about, um, you know, putting into practice such a locally driven, um, complex pedagogical framework, right? That that largely hasn't been something we've talked about a great deal um, prior, you know, to our contemporary times. Um, but a couple of ways that I um, think about um, culturally sustaining pedagogy in my role is um, twofold. One is what do future teachers need to know and understand about the dynamic cultural practices of their students, particularly their non-dominant students? Um, and then I also, I hadn't thought of this while I was listening to my colleagues, thinking about for our teachers, especially teachers who come from non-dominant communities and multilingual communities, how do I as a faculty member or mentor um, or teacher coach support them to bring their full selves um, into the classroom, into leadership roles, um, and nurture really their, um, their gifts in terms of what they might do for students who are similar to them or different from them as well. So a couple examples of how that looks. Um, for me, one way that looks is in classroom environments, like as a faculty who teaches courses that you know all teachers have to go through, asking students to spend time thinking about learning outside of the four walls of the classroom. Um, so really pushing students um, and future teachers to look at how um, communities, family settings, intergenerational learning and, and learning on and with land occurs. Um, the same, um, the same, uh, what I often find myself doing in collaboration with many, um, in my region, which is to ask teachers who are in practice already serving, um, communities, particularly communities, um, that are non-dominant to think about what does it mean to use community pedagogies in the classroom? 
So asking, um, you know, community partners, whether they be um, parent groups, um, tribal nation uh, departments, or, um, you know, other committees to be leads in what teachers might um, do and how they might spend their time um, in professional development. We have a couple of, um, you know, really vibrant like projects that focus a great deal on um, indigenous education, and indigenous educators. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the context of Idaho, um, we I'm at one of the state institutions, but the, the state of Idaho is largely serving a, a rural population. Um, and our tribal students are everywhere all over the nation, but many of our um, of our tribal students in the state of Idaho are also in rural schools. So thinking about the intersections of land and waterways um, of, of, of non-dominant ways of learning that are often not showing up in our books um, and our, our textbooks and our, our teaching standards are things that we have to think really carefully about. Um, and in my role, I get to um, not, work within the parameters of our state, but also I'm, I'm always supported to look for sources of funding and innovation that we can bring to our state. So some of, I think, the most exciting things that I get to do around um, culturally sustaining pedagogy is to co-design locally what, um, what does culturally sustaining practice mean for a specific community um, and then how do we really partner like as an institution to accredit that, right? To, to support teachers to get credits um, towards their degrees or their credentials, um, but also really to deeply impact how teachers think about what knowledge is, where knowledge comes from, right? And how like relationships to knowledge such as land, water, other than human beings can influence the ways that children learn and think um, and to treat that information very seriously. Um, so I, I, f I feel like, you know, thinking about how we nurture teachers and how we nurture students um, or teachers to nurture students in K-12 um, is a space I get to, to really spend a lot of time in. And that work is so local. I think that's one of the really exciting things about this framework is there isn't just one way to do this. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop there. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing um, a little bit about your background and how you engage in this work. We have a couple people with their hands raised. Um, so I will open it up for the Q&A. Again, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, or you can raise your hand and we can chat. So um, Chain, I will start with you. Are you able to unmute? Uh, actually, I don't have a question, but uh, but I'm kind of more interested in applying this pedagogy into a higher education environment. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so that's why I'm here to learn more about uh, this pedagogy. So I will appreciate any guidance if how if I wanted to apply this to kind of for undergraduate student, something like that. It's oh. a great question. So I'll, I'll go ahead and share a couple of ideas. Um, thanks um, for your just thinking about this, I think I love this infographic that um, has been shared. And I think one thing as someone who also works with undergraduates in higher education, that this can be a useful tool for, for is to just take this and put this next to my syllabus and to say, where am I providing opportunities to do each of these four um, categories? I think that's a good way to start. One way that I've started and a, a number of my colleagues who um, I work with um, do similarly is asking questions about where is there an assignment where I support my students to authentically engage in um, community learning outside of the controlled environment of the school, right? And then also when are we getting to learn um, from firsthand perspectives of communities themselves? Um, and how, you know, how do I support my students to come to know what kinds of cultures are existing and then how I might partner in sustaining them? Um, that can also be done with lots of great resources. I know people have put in the chat a few of them, but, you know, partnering a few readings around each of these um, tenants, I think, is a really good place to start. Thank you so much. I will take a look at the chat box. 
Thank you. All right, and then, oh, am I? Oh, it's a pin. Um, all right, we have a question in the Q&A uh, for Vanessa. Recognizing that there can be some conflicts around certain environmental issues, is there an avenue for allowing indigenous students to become activists without being skewered yourselves? I talked with an Idaho legislator in 2020 about why she opposed the adoption of Gen NGSS standards because it incorporated questions around impacts of mining and might hurt some parents' feelings. I'm in the, uh, I'm not sure if I'm gonna pronounce this correctly, Chilcat Valley, where the local tribes are very visibly opposing a hard rock mine, which puts salmon streams at risk. It's a very relevant culture sustaining action. Um, I, yeah, I think, I mean, obviously I think your question is appropriate that we live in a pretty like politicized, um, economy where things are not people are not often looking out for the well-being of others <laughs> you know and we've got a lot of ways that we've not been prepared to talk about the impacts of colonization in our country and extractive economies so i think wading into conversations that acknowledge the history and legacy that is are always st important steps but i think one of the ways that i've um, worked over the years is Anytime we talk about our place, we need to talk about its history, and that always is going to include Indigenous perspectives. Um, and the way we need to do that is in partnership with the, the people who are related to the local lands that we live on. And I think that tribes speak very well for themselves on these issues. So I think anytime I'm thinking about working with K-12 students and teachers, um, it's not, I don't think it's as important for um, me as a university professor to be the spokesperson for all of these issues, but to think about the people who are living real everyday lives that are concerned with intersections of land, cultural continuity, well-being, and let them tell their stories. Um, and I can be a facilitator in that work. Um, so I think that, you know, sidestepping a bit what you're telling people to do or not is just being a facilitator of important information um, and making that be the center piece. So I think probably some of my colleagues have some comments on that as well. Any other thoughts? Uh, I don't. I don't have anything to add other than Vanessa. You you said that beautifully. Right. Any other questions? While we're waiting, um, when we think back to the four elements of um, culture sustaining pedagogy, I wonder if I can put some in here. I don't think I can, but I'll put this question in the chat. Um, can you provide examples of how you ensure that you're that you center students' backgrounds, languages, cultures, and ways of knowing in your work? So I'm gonna put this in the chat so everyone can see. I don't mind getting us started on this one. Okay. Uh, so, like I mentioned in my previous response, in our office, we implement policy at the state level, and part of some of the programs that we implement um, are, and I'm going to just kind of like list some out here to, to give you a, 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 an idea about the type of work. So, we have an early literacy community grant program where we identify community-based organizations and post-secondary institutions and entities that are not schools and districts to provide early literacy supports, which look like high dosage tutoring, training for high dosage tutors and uh, family, and family and community engagement around early literacy that's culturally and linguistically responsive. Uh, we also have um, our Yale Outcomes Program, which identifies districts that are experiencing or receiving outcomes that demonstrate uh, a need to improve the learning and experience of students who are designated as English learners, learning English as a new language. Um, 
There is also our student success plan grant programs and our student success plans. Our plans include um, kind of three aspects. One aspect is that it is a strategic plan that's intended to be implemented across every local education agency in the state. So all schools, all districts, all ESDs. And there's part of that is a grant program that funds um, those entities that I just mentioned, as well as community-based organizations to implement projects and programs that are aligned to the strategies and the student success plans. We have five student success plans currently, the African-American Black Student Success Plan, the Latino, Latina, Latinx Student Success Plan, the LGBTQ2SIA Plus Student Success Plan, the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Student Success Plan, and the Immigrant Refugee Student Success Plan, which just got passed last legislative session, so we're still building it. Um, we recognize as a state agency, we are not um, at the, we, we don't have the, the proximity to truly understand the needs of students in schools right now that hold these identities. And there's also a, a need to go beyond the perspective of teachers and administrators and um, staff of community-based organizations. Although those perspectives are very important and they're part of the conversation, we have to go beyond that and we have to center the development of these strategies, the voice of students and the voice of their families. And so we, um, you know, we always say for community, by community. These plans are for community. They're also by community. So each student success plan has an advisory group that we coordinate at the state level that meets pretty regularly um, and uh, also gets together across advisory groups. Because one thing that we have been charged with um, in the most recent legislative session is to um, align all of our student success plans and really start to think about how we are serving intersections of students across multiple student success plans. Uh, just to, to, to quote Kimberly Crenshaw, right, there is no such thing as a single identity issue because we don't live single identity lives. And so really understanding how we can uh, like address those intersections of compounding oppression that is existing within our systems. Um, we have developed gender guidance for school districts to be able to understand how to better serve gender expansive students and how to um, improve their policies and practices around better supporting queer students. And uh, we have also developed a series of equity modules that are available across the state to help educators kind of do like the equity 101 reflections, right? The difference between equality and equity, the different types of tensions that exist with implementing equity-based initiatives and policies. Um, those latter two examples are some more kind of proximal resources and documents that we've created to uh, kind of reach at that school level, at that district level for practitioners to start to improve practices. We've also uh, done a lot of work through our Office of Indian Education around um, ensuring that there is as much as possible resource and shared understanding around tribal history and shared history and what we call the nine essential understandings. Um, so these are the, the essential understandings of Native Americans in Oregon. And, and this was made in partnership led by uh, members of each of the tribes to ensure that it is a holistic representation of our tribal history and shared history. Um, so those are just a couple of examples. I'll drop some links in the chat in case anyone's interested in learning more about these things. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to add? Um, can I add that uh, living in California, we have the California Roadmap, the English Language Learner <clears throat> Roadmap. So there's there are initiatives that are being implemented across California to really get to know this roadmap, but it's all about culturally sustaining pedagogy with assets-based learning. It's um, divided into principles, and principle one is really all about um, the assets-oriented teaching in the classroom, so really creating lessons that honor students' home language, their experience, their culture, so as a school, we spent a whole year focused on principle one. We're slowly moving into principle two. I think it takes time to really create systemic changes across 
a school. We're a charter school. We're very small. We're our own district. So all of these um, policies that big districts and um, initiatives that big districts have, you know, for our school, it's, it's all homegrown and we're very much uh, as needed basis. So whatever we see, we start tackling. But the California English Language Roadmap is a really great resource for anyone out there if you're really looking to, to find examples that are concrete. Um, I know the principle too, the one that we're working on is really creating the quality of instruction with ELD, English language development and designated versus integrated, all that, the, the jargon that goes along with being in, in the EL world. But the, the fact that we have to use students' background and knowledge and texts that are, that are culturally appropriate is like a huge, huge um, Thing that we we definitely strive for at our escuelita but that's a great um, resource to have if you haven't looked at it take a look at it it's online it's free thank you anyone else like to respond to that question I'm going to just drop one more resource that I forgot to drop in the chat. And this one is actually for families. Um, and it's our one of our most recent guidance documents. And it's the Oregon Community Early Literacy Framework. And I think it gets to um, some of the, the, the question that's in the chat around guidance directly for families around improving and, and maybe not improving, but, but understanding how what they are doing at home around their culture, the storytelling, the singing, like all of that is literacy development and um, just kind of breaking down those, those, those walls between what happens. I think you cut out at the very end. Um, oh. or, yeah. Sorry, I was saying uh, to, to break down the walls between the literacy learning that happens inside the school building during the school day to the literacy learning that happens beyond the bell at home in communities. Okay, thank you. I want to just add kind of a plug. I'm just re hearing a couple of the other um, questions in the chat. And I think the examples that... Um, Kema and Mariana are providing are excellent. And I think it is real to think about the different um, public and policy funding spaces that we operate in across this diverse nation of ours. And so some of us are in states that are not um, largely funding the development or articulation of the kinds of documents that I think have just been shared, which are really beautiful. Um, but there was a question in the chat around, you know, how do we do this work when we are not supported it's always deprioritized. And, and that is a reality for many of us. And, and even in some of our states that appear to have a lot of funding, I think that is still a challenge. But I think a thread that um, I hear in this group and I hear frequently in my work around you know, culturally sustaining pedagogies is it takes a critical mass of people um, to do this work. And that a critical mass could be two to three teachers. It could be a teacher, a parent, and a student, right? But thinking about, I think, some of the ways um, that you might start this conversation and form working groups to prioritize or ask questions about what is it that, um, you know, how have we audited what oppressive factors are impacting our students or interrupting their access to learning, right? What are the concerns of families? What do families want sustained um, in, the, you know, in the school environment and why? I think are really powerful steps in that direction that don't always require, um, you know, some of the supports we've come to, to, to see, you know, outlined for us, but they also do move people, right? So I just want to encourage that. I've, I see a lot of that work in my state of Idaho, where there's some really amazing things going on. They are not well documented beyond the practice of the groups that engage in that work together, but they do, they do mobilize and change things um, over time. So just a little plug for us smaller states. <laughs> Thank you. And I think you're getting at that first question in the Q&A um, from Sharon Nelson Barber about what about context for teachers are asked by district to not invite community members and elders. 
So thank you. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts about maybe to about their experience with that or, you know, um, offer any insights to address that? I, I'm not sure I have any insights. I just want to affirm what Vanessa was sharing. And, um, you know, it, it's hard. This is this is work that is hard. <laughs> and it's I always say it's hard work, but it's also heart work. And um, just recognizing how, how, how much more difficult it is when that support is not there. And when particularly like the higher, the higher you go in, in levels of leadership or authority within a organization, within a region, within a state, um, that, that support, it really uh, makes a big difference. Thank you. Any other thoughts on this one before I close it out? All right, I'm gonna to move to the next one and then we've got a couple people who have had their hands raised. Um, should we use terms like dominant culture as this may prevent culturally responsive teaching? Um, thank you for your input. I had this conversation with one of our uh, leaders in the Office of Indian Education because it's a term I used a lot uh, to basically talk about like hegemonic culture, right? Or like white supremacy culture. Like there's a lot of different ways we can um, say it. And, and she told, I remember the conversation and the coaching she gave me. She said, you know, when we say dominant culture, we're deferring dominance. And so it's something that I've been kind of sitting with and um, I don't have a solution. It's just just a reflection. Is it bad to, to, just to name it? I suppose say dominant, say white culture. I think the uh, scholars in this area would agree. It might not necessarily be dominant. Is, is dominant, dominant a power or a number? Because where I worked, it was if it used dominant, you would also assume it's the one majority, and that, that's not necessarily, not necessarily the ones that they're in power. I think I'll add to that. Um, I think I think a lot of these words sometimes depend on audience and context. Um, so in my household, um, so my, I think and write and work with my partner who's um, an indigenous man and we have children. In our household, we would talk about white culture. If you ask my husband, what does he study as an anthropologist? He'd say, I study Eurocentric culture. I study white people. <laughs> Just as there's white people who study in Indians, right? That's kind of the foundation of anthropology. But with our with our children, we talk a great deal about dominant culture being power. So if if our children have an Apache identity, how do we navigate that the schools that they will spend time with will not affirm that identity, right? Or how will we navigate environments where they're around predominantly Apache people, all Apache people, right? And that there's you know cultural practices that are important that they know how to activate at that time. But when they move into spaces where that power is taken from them, right? And not legitimized, like how do we navigate that? And I, and I think that, um, I think I agree with everything everybody's saying. I, I'm not sure there's one word, but I think there's many ways we have to describe it. Um, and it's always morphing <laughs> in some ways, right? In some ways it's pretty stable, but I think it is very tricky to figure this out with, um, with our students and families, especially you know, if they aren't given the power or acknowledged for being powerful for who they are. Thank you. Any other thoughts for, about this one? All right. 
I'm going to move over to those um, who have their hands raised. Oh, I just see one. Um, Ju Wang, I'm going to um, request that you unmute to ask your question. Oh, hello. Thanks Hi. for the conversations. Very beautiful. It's pretty thought provoking. And also responding to Mariana's um, comments about, you know, early literacy and its connections to culturally sustaining pedagogies. And I guess like, you know, my question is the reading walls, right? As we are going through those challenges and the ne negotiations, I'm wondering, like, do you have any recommendations about, you know, how to create a or a promote a movement that combines culturally sustaining pedagogies with um, a strong understanding of how young kiddos learn to read, right? Not just re reading to learn, not just learning to read, but 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 reading to learn. So how do you you know navigate and negotiate the tensions among the reading wars and to use the authentic culturally sustaining pedagogies into your standards, your curriculum, and the cooperations with, with teachers, with schools, et cetera. So yeah, if you have any responses to that, thank you. So much for the question. Um, I want to I want to try to summarize the question because I think I heard a lot and I want to make sure that I that I answer the right question. And so is um matter of fact, I'm sorry, Ju, Ju can you can you repeat the question for me? Okay, I am um, muted again. So uh, in brief, the question is like, um, listening to you, I hear like in Oregon, you, the state standards and the movement that you are striving for is more like really, you know, um, echoed the culturally relevant pedagogy in teaching early literacy. But in the tensions, we are, you know, experiencing, experiencing the reading wars. And how do you negotiate? Like people say, okay, we, we, we have to use science of reading or that is that is the only, that is the most appropriate options. But sometimes, and we know that, right? But how would you ne negotiate? And what are your current, you know, uh, movement um, regarding to all these tensions happening in our country? Yes, and that's so real. And it, it is a huge tension that we're experiencing. So House Bill 3198 is what created our, our offices early literacy, but it's a larger um, initiative. It's one of our new Governor, Governor Tina Kotex initiatives. Um, so it includes not just the Oregon Department of Edu Education, it also includes the Department of Early Learning and Care, where there's a birth to five plan for increasing early literacy supports for children and families prior to engaging in school. And then in within that K-12 continuum, there are two efforts that are geared towards early literacy. And we define early literacy as literacy supports that happen between kindergarten and, sorry, pre-kindergarten and um, third grade. So uh, within that early elementary, early literacy effort, science of reading is, um, we the way that we, that we that it's named in statute and that we named it in rule is we pulled out the term research aligned literacy practices so as to not point towards any one kind of side of that particular argument that you were that you were broaching right now around the science of reading the science of reading is absolutely part of it we have two three actually efforts that are in place or in that early elementary space between PK and three. And one of them is our tribal grants. And that's funding that's going directly to tribes, our non federally recognized tribes to implement early literacy supports within that kind of grade band in that age range. Um, that one's more focused on language revitalization, which uh, is connected to, to all of the asks to, to the science of reading, to culturally responsive pedagogy, culturally sustaining pedagogy. It's revitalizing the languages that have been decimated through colonialism and through the, um, the you know, various things that have happened in American history. Uh, we have our community grants. I'm, I'm gonna start with the district grants. So we talked about tribal grants, then we have our district grants and those grants are going direct. That's the bulk of the funding in this initiative for our state agency. And it goes towards uh, providing 
funding for high dosage tutoring and early literacy supports within the K-12 space. Aside from that, there's also another project, which is the one that's implemented through my office, and that's the Community Early Literacy Framework. And through that, we have four objectives. One of them is the provision of high dosage tutoring. And so that's very specific. The way that it's defined is very specific. The threshold for meeting that definition is pretty high, and there is a high cost to it. It's also not a practice that's necessarily appropriate at that pre-K level, um, arguably, maybe even in the kindergarten level, there's a little more tutoring in that space, but um, it's it's definitely more appropriate for like first grade, second grade, third grade, and beyond. Um, there's also a provision in the statute that allows us to uh, implement efforts and funding, not just towards high dosage tutoring, but towards increasing community-based and, and just entities outside of the school day's capacity to provide high dosage tutoring. So training, training around cultural responsive practices, um, high dosage tutoring is expensive. High dosage tutoring in low instance languages is that much more expensive. Uh, and so really thinking about in that community space, how to provide not just linguistically appropriate, but like culturally appropriate um, high dosage tutoring, as well as culturally and linguistically appropriate family engagement for the provision of early learning services. That community early learning uh, framework, and I, I, I apologize to all the participants. I realized that all of the links that I was putting, I was sending it to the hosts. And so I wasn't, I wasn't actually sending it to you all, but hopefully you have those um, now. And the last link, the second to last link that I provided is that community early literacy framework document that uh, really pulls out our, how we conceptualize community early literacy and how we uh, conceptualize it in a way that is more accessible to students and families and not uh, not just kind of for the audience of educators and people that are familiar with literacy development stages and science of reading and all of the research that's around it. So it's all, it is aligned to research. It is aligned to practices, but it's gone through a lot of plain language reviews essentially to make it um, a lot more accessible to families. And I, I hope that answered the question. Can I add on something? We've partnered with West Ed um, the, through the Joyful Literacy with Young Children, kind of a partnership with our TK12 teachers. I'll put the I'll put the link in in the chat, but all the information and how teachers kind of through diverse culturally appropriate books, um, kids are learning, you know, joyfully and foundational skills and all in in going through this this cycle of dialogic approach where they're talking to teachers, like thinking critically. I was with TKers for a couple of weeks this last couple of weeks and I tried all these strategies with them and they are super excited to learn. So when we talk about, you know, those reading wars, yeah, they exist. Kids need foundational skills in order to be able to read and understand. So, I mean, they go hand in hand. And at the end of the day, if we want our kids to be critical thinkers, we need to teach those foundational skills. We need to be able to systematically and explicitly teach foundational skills. Once you know how to decode, then we, you know, we're working on meaning making through the read alouds that we do with our children at home, you know, with the parents and at school with their young babies. So I think the guide, the one that's in the link is very useful. There's a parent component, a family component as well. So that, and it's in, in various languages. I know they're working on multiple languages to try to get these out to families. So um, take a look. It's, Super fun. The kids are loving, you know, vocabulary, background knowledge, meaning making, and they're kindergartners. They're four and five, and you know, using all these big words, it's it's pretty impressive. So, you know, that's a practical thing you can you can start working on at your site if you're interested. Uh, in Maine, well, in Portland, the largest city, I just helped the uh, librarians of middle schools secure a. Uh, Grant from Stephen and Tabitha, Tabitha King for um, for li library and literacy, and it's for having high level interest books with low level reading, so that the seventh and eighth graders can go into the middle school libraries 
and find books that, that they they could actually take out instead of like the low level low level reading only on low level interest. They, they as you get older, there's other things you want to learn about or be exposed to that they don't. There are the, those, those books are not always the ones that districts are able to afford because they have to get make sure that um, that the, the, the beginners get their stuff done. But the older older students that talked to the multilingual teacher and asked her what's her dream. So her dream was that there would be a school in the library. They can go into the library and go find books that they would be interested in that they could read. Because at that point, they weren't. They were books they can read, but all baby books. And they wanted higher level interest. And so we, and I, and I encouraged them, because now we have the money, we encouraged them to have the students participate in picking the books to put in the library. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm conscious of the time, but there's a really cool question in the Q&A that I, I, I'm hoping that we can all uh, share before I wrap up. Um, and then the panelists, there's two other questions. Um, one is for Vanessa specifically, and then there's another one about ESL lessons. If you can type your answers as we, as we close out the Q&A session. Um, but the one that um, I think is a great kind of one for all of us uh, or all of you all to reflect on is if you can provide one specific concrete example of having to use culturally sustaining pedagogy uh, that you're proud of. Does anyone like to start with that one? I'll read it. Oh, no, you go ahead, Vanessa. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Mariana. It's you. <laughs> um, so I, one effort that I've been involved in um, at the University of Idaho is called iKeep. So it's Indigenous Knowledge for Effective Education Program, and it um, nurtures Indigenous uh, scholars to become educators in the K-12 system. We've moved, uh, expanded beyond that to think about um, you know, culturally sustaining pedagogies for indigenous communities as an ecosystem. So we work with ed leaders, we, we work with teachers in service, um, but we also work now with young people. So thinking about, um, we call it I keep for young people, thinking about how do we take advantage of our, um, our new space of dual credit. So the good use of high school credits to count for college credits, but really focus on nurturing um, young indigenous people who want to have conversations about education. That doesn't necessarily mean that they have to become teachers, but we always say everyone is involved in education in our communities, in our households. So what is it that you um, want to contribute? What do you think about what education should be like? How do you want to redefine it? Um, and listening to those young people in those courses that have been designed um, in our state and region is so beautiful. And it makes me just think about, um, you know, what, what what would be different about our schools if we asked families and young people to tell us what they need, right? And how um, might that be, I think, the centerpiece of some of these policy and funding discussions that we're having. So I think I'm really most proud of, of thinking about how it is that our young people, you know, drive these conversations and, and how we when we ask them, they do tell us what they need. So inspirational to hear from um, the, the other panel members about how this is implemented in, in such different contexts and then just feeling so excited and reinvigorated. Uh, the example I'm going to pull out is it's a little bittersweet because um, it's a program that we started with our ESSER, which is Emergency School Relief Funds. I'm, I know I'm butchering that acronym, Elementary School Emergency Relief I'm still probably butch butchering that acronym, but it's it's essentially funding that uh, many educational entities received from the federal government to address the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Those funds um, are sunsetting. So the last day for that for the grant program that I'm talking about was um, September 30th of this year. 
And uh, we were able to implement a program with those funds. It was one of our key investments. It was the culturally specific after school learning grant program. And through that grant program, we were able to implement 26 different programs across the state that uh, were all beautiful examples of culturally sustaining pedagogy. Just some examples, uh, one with in partnership with um, United Way and the Boys and Girls Club, where we were doing services that were specific to um, students who had parents who were incarcerated um, and uh, after school programming that was focused on academic development and culturally affirming practices and um, just a, a, there's six pillars to it but that one was really exciting there was one through the Chinese Friendship Academy that was specifically for Chinese students in the Portland metro area um, that focused on a college readiness that was a, a beautiful example that was um, kind of formed through the voice of the students that were part of that program. And so it was just really beautiful to see all of that come together. I mean, there was so many different examples that I'm, I'm having a hard time, like just the ones from the top of my, of my mind, one that was in Bend, that was a after-school program, particularly for neurodivergent students and what culturally sustaining, culturally relevant practices look like for that particular group of students really encompassing not just their culture, not just their race, not just their language, but also their neurodivergency. That was really, really cool. Um, we had a program that was um, through the Immigrant Refugee Community Organization that really focused on uh, like immigrant refugee communities and providing supports to students from those communities in various places across the state. And so that I think that is a program that I would I would elevate that I that I'm really excited about, but again bittersweet because it's done and it's not coming back unfortunately unless the Oregon legislature establishes a program uh, which hopefully there's precedent for because of the amazing impacts from from this example. Um, something that I think we're very proud of is just our we're in our we're going into our 21st year as a dual language immersion program and moving into this new, very techie world, <laughs> trying to figure out how do we how do we continue to to do all this great work <clears throat> and incorporate you know, culturally sustaining pedagogy through technology as well for our students. So we've tried to invest in some programs, online programs, and really trying to, to have our kids be critical thinkers when it comes to seeing you know, what's out there in the world and questioning where, where they get their news from. Um, it's, it's super important to us. So I think we're working towards that. That's something that's in the works. Um, but definitely my biggest like pride is all the money that we've spent on books in the classroom, I think. As a school, we've spent close to a million dollars in the last like eight years. I've gone to so many different, you know, conferences and nobody can say that. So I'm like, oh my God, we're so blessed with all this money that comes and and our teachers are very conscientious of what they choose and what they pick so that all kids are are seeing the books that they read out loud to their kids are are very diverse and I think that is something that I, I hold dear to my heart that reading and you know our kids will learn the win the windows, the sliding doors, the all of those different types of doors. Uh, we're we're very lucky to have. So if anything, that's that's my pride and joy right now. It'll change eventually, but right now that books through books we can see the world. Uh, one thing that we that. And some districts that I've partnered with, um, we've been um, art therapists. And through art therapy, the students, um, or through art, they, they, they learn about their collective loss and how, what, what their vision is and what, what they want, what they're inspired to be, and try to acknowledge what they've gone through, be it um, we have students who have walked here from Brazil, um, have gone through that that perceived trauma. Um, you have people living in places without families or whatever, and just helping them to be okay in the setting. And we have um, performers who come in 
um, uh, uh, that work with the students and acting, uh, doing do, actually doing um, street theater, uh, talking about their experiences, uh, doing productions, but but also as the art therapy, so they can draw what they think is going on and then display it and tell the story. So a, being able to talk about it and share their, their perceived gr grieving about their experiences is very helpful for them. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for the question. It was such a great one, um, better than the one we had planned to wrap up with, because <laughs> um, it left with a smile. And, and you guys are all very passionate about the work that you do. Um, so thank you all for sharing um, sharing those. And thank you for the question. Um, we are getting really close to the wrap up time, but we did have that last question about what's the most important thing you want educators to know about culturally sustaining pedagogy. And if we could just do a quick round robin um, and then I'll wrap up the, the webinar. So um, who would like to start? What do you want people walking away with? Asset-based teaching and learning. That's the most important thing. Look at your kids and think of the great things that they can bring to your classroom and what they have, not the deficit mindset. Yeah, the, the students are special. They bring, as you said, they bring something to the classroom. Uh, they bring their, their experiences, their culture. They bring things that I can't bring. And if they're, if, they're, if they're allowed to share their experiences and have staff understand how they got there and what they need to move forward is a win-win. And we want, the, want them to come back. Like, yeah, this teacher gets me. They listen to what I'm saying. They don't say I'm wrong. They say, well, let's look at that and let's talk about it. And how do you feel about it? And what do, what do you think you should do? Not, not, not pleasant judgment on right versus wrong, but yours, your journey is your journey. I can't tell you it was a wrong one. That's, that's what it was. And I need, I need to appreciate that and understand the differences. Thank you. I'm going to cheat and turn two things. One, first, um, just to echo what's been said is humans learn culturally and socially. Um, and to have access to those repertoires is hugely important to how we make meaning and connect to the world around us. Um, so don't deny people that, um, that those tools. Um, the other thing is I've been thinking a lot about um, in my research and, and, and on other adventures is how important administrators, educators, and teachers are in the lives of children. Um, hugely important in creating or denying opportunity. Um, so culturally sustaining pedagogy is often a lifeline or it is life and death um, sometimes for our children. And so really take that seriously. You're having an impact whether you realize it or not. Um, support our children to have access um, to their full repertoire as they learn and grow. I want to say ditto to what the other three panelists shared. Because it was all <laughs> so on point. And um, what I can add to it is uh, what's really coming up for me right now is is holistic, comprehensive representation, um, intersectional representation, the danger of a monolithic interpretation of a culture, um, really understanding how to how to provide affirming practices, affirming learning environments requires us to challenge what we think we know about identities that we don't hold, especially as educators. Wow, thank you all so much for sh being here and willing to share your expertise with us. Um, this has been a really great learning experience um, for me personally, and I'm sure a lot of those uh, who are joining. Um, and so um, please, you know, there's the chat function. I'm gonna um, share some resources. And um, if you wanna connect later, uh, feel free to reach out and I'll, I'll have my email address up at the end of the, of the session today. So, all right. So here are some um, available open source resources um, related to culturally sitting pedagogy and equity. Really quickly, I'm just gonna make sure, oops, that 
okay, every, all my settings are good. Um, so the first three are from the RHEL program. The first two on our screen is from RHEL West. Uh, the first is an infographic on systemic factors that shape multilingual learners' educational opportunities and outcomes. The second is an infographic on an asset-based approach to multilingual learner terminology. The third is from Mel RHEL Midwest. It's an infographic on building inclusive and equitable learning environments. And these links, if they're not in the chat already, will, will be there soon. Other helpful resources uh, that I've come across with my own work is the New York State Education Department's Culturally Responsive Sustaining Education Framework and Resources. This is a very comprehensive framework that I often turn to to see examples of how to um, promote culturally responsive sustaining education at different levels of the education system. Uh, the second is University of Hawaii Hilo's Nahonua Maoli Ola, the Hawaiian Cultural Pathways for Healthy and Responsive Learning Environments. It outlines a cultural framework for examining and attending to the educational and cultural well-being of Hawaii's leaders. And then lastly, the People Forget Education have a What Matters in Indigenous Education resource that explores an, an Indigenous approach to quality learning environments and relevant competencies. So these links uh, should also be in the chat. So to close out, I wanna thank everyone for engaging with the presenters, especially the, pre the presenters for being willing to share their knowledge with us. Um, before you leave, we kindly ask that you take uh, just a couple minutes to answer the stakeholder feedback survey. It's just a couple questions that ask, um, that ask about ways we can improve uh, the webinar. We have a QR code here on this slide, but there will also be a link to it in the chat. Um, and uh, so I'll just pause here for a minute so people can scan that if they would like. And if you have any questions for me or the presenters, um, feel free to reach out. Uh, here's my email address. I'm happy to connect you or to share additional resources or if you have any other questions related to the topic, I'm, I'm happy to engage in conversation with you. So with that, again, thank you all. Um, yeah, that's that wraps up our, our webinar and I look forward to you know seeing where some of the work continues to go and, and keeping up with some of the really the really great stuff that you guys shared today. <laughs>